Do you think that immortality is impossible? Unless we define it through kind of like AI copying your brain. Let's put that, I mean, physical immortality. Do you believe that that is, that is impossible? <laughs> well, I, I like to tell people that I'm immortal because I think the mindset that it gives me is a very healthy mindset for me. <laughs> we can come to, you know, you, you talk a lot about the emotional aspects of aging in your book. I love that chapter. We can come to that later. But that's, I don't really believe it's true. I think the odds that you could achieve that level of change in aging is non-zero, but close. <laughs> so so I, I'm skeptical that that can be done. I think it's fair to say, but I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Of course, nobody's ultimately going to be immortal because you're going to get hit by a bus sooner or later. Yeah. But what you're really talking about is being immortal in terms of dying from aging. Yeah. Well, I guess what yeah. I'm really saying yeah. is, can one ever get to the point where resilience is high enough yeah. that you cannot die from disease? I have seen nothing so far that suggests that's possible, okay? But yeah. but that doesn't mean it isn't possible. Yeah, yeah. And then that gets even to physical frailty and sarcopenia mm -hmm. and things like that, where mm -hmm. even when we see centenarians and super centenarians, their frailty is still pretty remarkable. Meaning? Uh, meaning like they still look pretty feeble and frail. But, like, uh, I mean, the age adjusted, they're great. Yeah. But yeah, at yeah, the end of the yeah. day, yeah. Like when they're 110, they yeah. still look like someone who's in the final years of yeah. their life, just as someone would if they were 84, 85. Yeah. I mean, I had two grandmothers that lived to almost 100. One died at 99 and the other 101. And the, the one at 101, I would say that at 90, she was driving at 95. I think she quit driving. She bowled a 238 game at 93. She was looked like a at ninety three. Yeah, yeah. But but so that's she my looked point. like a seventy something year old. Yeah, at that exactly. Point. My point is, she yeah. just had a phase shift of twenty yeah. years, yeah. but it didn't yeah. undo no. the inevitability yeah. of that decline. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that. I I think that you know, but getting us to a hundred is a good goal. I think. <laughs> so. I, I agree completely. Do you think that again, we're spending too much time worrying about finding? immortality, escape velocity, understanding the core of aging, when maybe we should be spending more time on how do we preserve health span in the last decade of life? Um, why is it that most people in the final decade of their life are physically too frail to enjoy life, are cognitively just, you know, even, even absent Alzheimer's disease, they're just not cognitively sharp enough. They're in pain. They've, they're fracturing their hips. They're not doing what, you know, what gave them joy through most yeah, of I their life. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think that uh, we should fund um, aging somewhere closer to the level we're funding cancer and answer both of those questions at the same time. I think one of them is a translational question about how do we slow aging as much as we can right now and improve the health of the population as much as possible. And the other one is a basic science question. Can we stop aging? Can we reverse aging? No one can. If anybody has the tells you they have the answers to that, they're lying to you or they're lying to themselves. Okay, we don't know, and uh, I think that. But it's it's maybe the most important question in biology, and we should be throwing money at it. So we've seen all this money go into like the private sector side, biotech companies, supplement companies, longevity clinics and on and on. And I think that's great, by the way. And I've spent a lot of my time working with those groups because I think it's important. But we're not seeing the academic funding that's going into the basic science of aging and longevity. And the big questions still that you just raised are still not answered. And so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm changing your, your question to a plea for more funding. And unfortunately, the the kind of funding that supports that is usually government funding, foundation funding, and, and that's under major threat right now. So it's, uh, I'm really worried that we're not going to answer those questions. So. Well, it's funny. We, th this was a discussion that came up um, on a longevity roundtable. I think most people, myself included, were really surprised to hear how disparate the funding differences are and how if you could um, put, I don't know, if you could reallocate 10% of funding from the disease specific pools to the age yeah. pools, yeah. Um, it, it could have an enormous difference oh, based on how little the funding is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when you think about the big chronic diseases, yeah. cardiovascular disease, cancer, 
uh, dementing diseases and metabolic diseases, right? Yep. Those would be the big four. I've often maintained that the, that the least inevitable of them is ironically the one that is the most deadly today, which is cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I, I agree. The atherosclerotic that. diseases, so cerebro and, and, and cardiovascular, um, ironically, the most preventable. Yeah, I think Both so too. because we have the best understanding of what causes them and we couple that with the most tools to prevent them, whether it be uh, tools to combat hypertension, dyslipidemia, et cetera. And they're responsible to, uh, responsive to, to lifestyle yeah. modification. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Which of those major diseases of the other three, dementing, cancer, metabolic, do you believe is the most inevitable to our species? I wouldn't put uh, metabolic I in agree. that category for yep. sure, because I see that more like cardiovascular. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, so of the other two, cancer and dementing or neurodegenerative diseases, which one is just seemingly inevitable? We don't know enough about dementia to answer, but I will say that cancer is a little bit different than these other diseases, I think, and it's not a, it, it, and it may be less modifiable by uh, longevity interventions. Um, Dementia, we, we just don't know. My guess is it's highly modifiable too, but uh, there's not enough data to be sure of that like there is for metabolic and cardiovascular disease. But cancer is 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 an accumulation of mutations, so it's a, a more defined event that's happening. It's also an impact on the immune system that's different a little bit than normal aging, so it may be less um, approachable from a longevity viewpoint. It, yeah, it's funny. That's exactly my view. Uh, that cancer is the most inevitable of these diseases. Yeah. Do you think that the inevitability or the age-related component stems more from the accumulation of mutations or the weakening of the immune system? It's probably both. I mean, you, you don't get to cancer without the right mutations happening. Um, but I think we're learning more and more that the immune system is playing a major role in it and that we can see that very clearly from the interventions that improve immune function and they're having a big role in certain types of tumors. And, but I think that's going to be true for Alzheimer's and the dementia as well. We've completely underestimated the role of inflammation in the immune system and th those diseases as well. And they may be the primary drivers. You know, I, I, I kind of have got, so I'm very frustrated by some of these fields. One of them is Alzheimer's, you know, the, um, I kind of feel like, you know, the, that one of these Alzheimer's researchers, they're going to die at some point of 90 and on their, on their tombstone, it's going to be like, you know, major accomplishment was to completely remove plaques from the brain, died of Alzheimer's at 94. You know, it's, 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 it's uh, th th there's been so much focus on one or two mechanisms of disease that we spent 30 years not studying the others, which may be more important. And why do you think that, I mean, I write about it in the book, but I, yeah. I'm really curious as to why you think that's happened. And because and, that's not a, unfortunately, that's not an isolated incident in science. So no. why do you think it's happening in a field where the results are otherwise so dismal? What's the, what's the saying that scientific progress happens one funeral, one funeral at a time? time. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's part of it. You know, you get people that, are, that have successful research programs and uh, they're postdocs get hired in all the jobs. And, and so when you take a field and it grows from a small field to a bigger field, you, everybody can draw their lineage back to four or five different PIs. And, and so whatever models, and those PIs get really focused on those models and they see that as their ticket to prizes and things like that. And so then the, you, you focus on a, a subset of the disease mechanisms at the exclusion of all others. And I, I don't want to single Alzheimer's out. I think a lot of diseases meet that category, but it's unfortunate because what we're realizing is that you know, there's a lot of factors that contribute to any disease. And I think longevity may be a, an interesting way of looking at it. Like, I think it's better, like, I'll take a, take a mouse, okay? It, we've tried to make Alzheimer's models in mice, and they, they don't prove that informative. Why? You're, make, you're creating a disease a mouse doesn't get genetically in a young mouse <laughs> and comparing that to a natural disease in an old human. I think it, you learn more about Alzheimer's if you look at the brain neurodegenerative changes that happen in the mouse normally with aging. The, the downstream things are different, but the drivers may be the very similar to the ones that are driving Alzheimer's. And that may be a better model of Alzheimer's than trying to artificially create something that a mouse doesn't get. So that's what I think aging is helping change that perspective that, you know, the, the drivers of aging, I think, are very similar between a mouse and a human. 
the, the downstream events can be different, uh, but the drivers are what we care about, right? So. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future.